Here's a question for you. What links together an enormous custom-made modular synthesizer, a giant metal chicken, and various musical mutilations of taxidermy? The answer is, of course, a nervous squirrel. My name's Dave, and uh, yeah, I guess I make things for a living, but that includes uh, yeah, mechanical and electronic things and all sorts of bits and bobs. I worked in a lot of workshops on a freelance basis and that was a really great way to learn particular skills or um, in the early days to, re to remain employed as a freelancer at a particular workshop. They'd say to you, uh, have you done fiberglass before? And you'd just sort of say yes and then learn really quickly from the other guys who'd been doing it for years who are often glad to help out and you know pass on their sort of skills. So. Uh, yeah, it's interesting to have a go at doing a bit of everything. It's funny, the badgerman crops up now and again. It started as uh, a joke with a friend where he, uh, we were doing this installation and uh, he said, what would you build a theremin into? Because we were sat there sort of babysitting 12 theremins and I said, maybe a badger. And he immediately named it the badgerman. So I only really made it to <laughs> for this sort of entertain this one guy. The badgerman was quite an early project and it was just really difficult because the the badger's the wrong shape to build a enclosure into and it had a wire frame which had to come out because it was interfering with the capacitive field of the theremin and so it was a really difficult one in terms of wrestling with the topography of a badger and trying to put it on the stand and have it all lined up. So one really interesting commission was for the composer Nick Ryan. Um, he wanted to make a machine that uh, created compositions by mapping pieces of space debris passing over the UK. And um, what would happen is a piece would be detected drifting over the UK and then it was mapped to this massive metre and a half long aluminium cylinder with I think over a, a thousand tracks recorded on it, but they were loops, they weren't spiral. It was a sort of phonograph, but with locked grooves. So it was this huge machine with eight styli that could then play back these different recordings depending on this sort of activity in space. So that was quite an amazing project because we had, I had to make it in, in two halves really. There was the machine that did the recording and recorded the cylinder and then there was the machine that did the, the playback, the final machine as well. So, um, yeah, and, and there was only one chance at recording the big expensive piece of aluminium. So we had to get a thousand tracks where the cutter would descend, it would rotate once and it would lift up and that had to be sort of perfect. So I made this sort of automated system to, to do that. And so that was a good one in terms of like engineering, uh, a good engineering challenge. So I started the modular back in 2008 and it started as a very sort of DIY project in a series of ice cream boxes. And then gradually it sort of, uh, yeah, just grew and grew, I guess, um, from finding circuit boards from different manufacturers and some of them are sort of very homemade and other ones are sort of made uh, from more professional um, circuit boards. I think, first of all, I looked at a lot of the different sort of uh, modular formats, which um, uh, I guess there are small ones and big ones. and went with the Moog size really, I think because I can get my big fat fingers around the, the knobs and I quite like the feeling of putting in the quarter inch jacks uh, rather than the smaller sort of mini jacks. 
I wanted to keep all the sort of the layout all the same, so all the knobs lined up. And um, there's a lot of uh, different things to consider when you're designing a panel. A lot of manufacturers approach it differently. So, for example, if you want to, um, it, uh, one manufacturer will call it sort of glide, one will call it portamento, one will call it slew. So you want to um, get all your terminology the same so that um, everything matches and makes one sort of coherent system and uh yeah so i mean the different elements are the graphical elements of getting everything to line up but also the terminology and uh, making it feel like one uh person has made the synthesizer and i'm hoping that the modules are self-explanatory enough that you can use it without uh needing to look up the um sort of any cryptic um labels or anything but usually the knob on the top left of the module is where you start and then the bottom right is kind of maybe the final level so there's um just like reading a page in a book there's a kind of um a path to follow uh with each module so there's um the themes of the different cabinets um up here we've got sort of logic so there's sort of um logic gates and um, multiplexers and um, uh, and various logic modules then there's um, cellular automata modules then there's various control voltage generating and processing modules these are all envelope generators so actually that whole section of the modular is just to do with control voltage really there's no nothing um, specifically audio there although obviously you could generate audio from combining them um, but yeah most of that is basically uh, control voltage generating and processing underneath there's 20 VCOs which can uh, switch between being a VCO or an LFO with the switch on there um, then we've got um, drums across the top this is a sequencer there's a trigger sequencer here which does trigger and gates by uh, you press the switch down and that's a trigger and up and it's a gate. Um, it also has a random mode, which is quite cool. So uh, as well as running like that, you can switch it onto random. This is a four channel control voltage sequencer. These are audio effects like echo and phaser. Here there's uh, VCAs and um, some more audio bits and bobs this is mostly filters and things related to uh, performance like the joysticks where you want them kind of obviously you'd want a joystick here rather than the top left corner oh and there's the, the oscilloscope as well um, more drums across the top including there's a 909 clone there these are sequential switches which are quite interesting where for example you can build up um you could build up a melody by playing the first line once then the second one then the first one and then third and fourth so you can sequence uh longer sort of events by uh by patching these in and they're chainable as well so you could have you could build up a bit like the old roland interfaces where you uh chain patterns together you can do that a bit with these this is a kind of polyphonic weird sequencer that you can access more than one stage at a time um, these this is a kind of getting into miscellaneous a little bit there's a couple of um, mutable instruments uh, more digital modules there there's a polydirectional sequencer which can go in different directions that's quite a fun one with the joystick you just set up something and then drive the dot around um, what else is there? Seven segment envelope generators and music from out space. Um, there's a analog mixer there, uh, another mixer. There's a um, speech jet talking synth there. Um, this one is a sampler based on the Robert Sonic's WAV trigger. So this is a kind of another homemade one. Um, well an implementation of somebody else's board but in modular sort of uh, breakout with uh, sort of connections for 
trigger and control voltage. But basically you have an SD card, you can load up what you want on it and then uh, and then either press the buttons to trigger samples or um, you can have inputs from the trigger sequencer, for example, to um, trigger samples. And um, that's it really. There's a, a sort of interface for the digital mixer there and a patch bay for the, the synths across the room, a bit like sort of Pac-Man where he goes off the edge and pops back on again. That's what that one is. It sort of links the cable up. But then um, I think everyone at Sound of Sound knows what a patch bay is, so I don't need to explain that. I think one module that's currently not screwed in, if I pull one out to show you, um, this is a fun one because it's a sort of German phaser that has uh, the little hidden light bulbs inside. And um, if you can see, there's a, a row of spares here as well. But that was a commercially bought um, PCB from Jürgen Heibel put together and then there's a, I think there's a couple of modifications so it's like that you can choose which feedback stage you want to uh, get the audio source from and um, yeah that's the fun thing about making your own is that you can um, uh, add any modifications or uh, change things to be exactly how you want it so yeah so that's one This is a rare one with a power switch because it's to save the light bulbs, but uh, there we go. It's got a glowing light. There's two of them. There's actually two because uh, if you're going to make one, it's you may as well make two. A vintage one of those is super expensive, but you can make one yourself for like 30 quid or something like that. A great thing about uh, making synth modules uh, yourself is definitely uh, two things, I guess. One is the ability to make each module exactly how you want it to be and add functionality. And uh, the other is the, the cost. For example, there's a, a mini Moog filter here that I don't think costs more than about £15 to make um, just because the PCB, you just buy the PCB and it, common components. So there's nothing sort of um, unusual in there. So it's more, more putting your time in. So, which I guess can be a bit of a, a trap sometimes when you say, oh, I don't need to buy that sequencer. It'll only take me 400 hours to make that or whatever. So, so that is something to be slightly aware of is the value of your time, but also you're learning stuff as well. So it's, it's kind of worth it from, from that point of view. But yeah, it's amazing, very satisfying to put together a mini mood filter and then uh, turn it on for the first time and just go, wow, and it, you know, it sounds really good. So I've definitely had quite a few moments like that where uh, something comes to life for the first time and adds all this functionality. And often manufacturers would, um, because they'd be manufacturing thousands of um, whatever it is they were making, they would try and keep the knob count down as much as possible for production costs reasons. But obviously knobs are only sort of, the potentiometer is only 50p or something. So you can add uh, extra parameters that you can control. So if you have a 909 kick drum, you can, uh, add, you can add potentiometers to a lot more values than were on the original machine. I think the original machine just has sort of pitch and volume and that's about it uh, or but yeah you can add i think there's a 909 up there it's got uh seven knobs on it instead of the more limited original some of the modules are like really classic ones from years ago like sort of Buchler filters or, or um or whatever some are more recent designs and uh some i have done myself so there's one there's the conway's game of life module which takes a, um, this sort of set of rules uh, designed by the mathematician John Conway and uh, there's a little a little grid of activity where these little cells sort of come to life and uh, interact and then disappear and so you've got this little sort of um, universe where these cells are 
popping into existence. But then all of the lights that are coming on and off within that matrix are mapped to trigger outputs on a grid. So you can plug all the outputs into uh, into drum sounds, for example, or envelope triggers. And then when you run the cellular automata little sequence, it will play the drums in, in a sort of in a pattern that corresponds with that. So I'd seen people modifying a PlayStation peripheral that I think was some kind of golf game. I've seen people using it to uh, control max MSP patches, but I hadn't seen a specifically a, a modular one. Anyway, this this is a three axis kind of string that you, you pull out. It's like a joystick with X and Y, but there's a Z axis as well. So there are two of these, which are quite fun to play with the gloves on. You can sort of describe sounds in space. And so you can walk around the room with say, six different parameters uh, linked up to the, the gloves. And then you can just sort of wave around. And uh, I, admittedly, I wouldn't use it to play classical music. Okay, so this is a, a module that has a Geiger counter in it. And if I turn on the click, you can hear a bit of background radiation. So it'll click now and again. But um, I've got this little jar of uh, uranium ore, if I put it in the little holder, you can hear the clicks increasing. Uh, so what it's doing is it's making a note of the clicks and um, it's choosing three of them and then it's using the middle click uh, depending on where it falls between the first and last to define a voltage between uh, between zero and ten I think so if the uh, middle click happens quite soon after the first then you get a low voltage but if it's uh, quite near the third click then you get a higher voltage if that makes sense so the basically the activity of the ore is being mapped to a changing voltage, which can then be uh, used as a sort of musical parameter. So you, uh, there's also a trigger out. So you can, as it's clicking, it's um, this trigger is outputting as well. There's a glide offset and range knob as well. So um, I'll actually I'll plug it in and you can you can hear it. Okay, so now you've got the um, the random voltage controlling an oscillator, and also the trigger uh, controlling an envelope. So that's what's happening there. There's a bit of glide. That's glide. Range and offset. So if I take it out, you can see it slows down. Um, here's a bigger piece of uranium ore. And obviously um, you can patch that into uh, not just pitch but whatever parameter you wanted to change so in instead of just making random bleeps you could use it to add some uh, you know unpredictability to to a patch but I just think it's amazing you can just get this seemingly inanimate rock and then some electronics detects a rock I think that's pretty cool this is a module based on a vintage oscilloscope it's just got a valve oscilloscope fitted to the back really but what's nice about it is you've got control over the y-axis as as normal but there's also an x-axis input so you can do strange patterns but ones that you can you can hear them as well so um, that's a fun one to play with I think the sculptures and the modular are definitely related there's elements in some of the sculptures are built in synthesizer elements or, or different audio capabilities but also making the modular involved sort of meta work and um, doing the making the cabinet sort of doing all the um, the walnut
I made a project a while ago um, just for a party really it just got it started out as a fun project and sort of got a bit out of hand but it was a, a sort of radio controlled um, alpaca fiberglass alpaca on some tank tracks with a sort of big sound system connected to it and uh, that was again that from the sort of sketchbooks I'd wanted to make some uh, some tracks for a while and then uh, I'd found you could buy these sort of cheap Honda clone petrol engines and um, I bought a couple of um, lawnmower clutches electromagnetic clutches to engage the track so I sort of found out about these parts then I was looking at a com company that sold fiberglass animals and the alpaca just had this sort of expression of superiority that just really worked so he got included and then obviously if we're having a party well i guess we kind of needed a sound system and so this all came together from various directions to create this sort of uh this object the little bits were sort of uh all waiting to just line up and then become that project which often is a way of um projects happening a similar situation with the the giant chicken um i'd made a quite a top heavy robot the previous year and I thought it'd be good to have a really sort of solid base I could make some even bigger so I went to this fantastic company called Agricultural Tires and Wheels Limited and just they had a whole yard full of all these crazy sort of wheels and so I, I pointed at four and they delivered them and that started off the sort of base and then um, I think at that point I wasn't even sure what would go on top but then um, I discovered that laser cutting steel triangles would was a cheap way of getting all that geometry worked out and so yeah the the, the chicken came along and i think the also the name he's called cluckminster fuller so the sort of joke helped the project to fruition as well um yeah so that was another example of uh the different elements that sort of sat there waiting until they all sort of come together and turn into a into a project So the point at which it stopped being a series of boxes was um, I decided it would make sense to build it into one sort of initial cabinet. And so I bought a power supply from synthesizers.com. That was uh, probably the tipping point of committing to, to making the, the instrument. So buying the power supply uh, was like a, that meant I had a good sort of starting foundation. And then, uh, and then it turned into, okay, this is a, a modular synth, but I had no plans to make it sort of the size it ended up. It, it just, um, it made sense. Each new module that you make suddenly, not only is a new module in itself, it also adds functionality to all the previous ones you made. So it grows really exponentially in terms of, you know, if you make, uh, a phaser, then you can try everything that you've made, including control voltage sources and everything through that phase and so suddenly the instrument just gets bigger and bigger so in terms of functionality there was never a overall master plan apart from wanting all the modules to um look similar in that they you know the layout everything sort of lined up and um from a sort of interface design point of view um i wanted it to look like a single kind of system uh, but basically the modules were done in order of interesting ones that I discovered, I think. And then every now and again, you'd say, okay, I'm going to do a batch of envelope generators. And so you'd, uh, maybe spend a few evenings putting those together, uh, as they were sort of core building block kind of modules. Um, but yeah, mostly, um, if you look at sort of new circuit boards that have come out, you'll find that some of the are sort of combinations of ones you already have so you think oh that's just a lfo with something else stuck to it but then sometimes you see one that's uh completely original and then that's exciting and um i've always got drawers full of ones that are waiting to be made up the first modules i started making were basic uh sort of synthesizer building blocks like the a vco and uh vca and 
a simple little filter and um but you very sort of quickly get into um so if you have one oscillator then you have a, a second one then that obviously can modulate the, the the first but then if you have a third one wow you've got all these like cross modulations going on you can patch it how you want and you very quickly get into quite an exciting um world of experimentation so i started off making um a few bits and pieces from uh music from outer space which was ray wilson's company and he designed some lovely sort of user-friendly circuit boards for beginners that were um, very easy to put together they, they were very sort of had a lot of space around the components and so they were forgiving for uh you know uh, if you're just starting with soldering they're good ones to start with so there was the music from outer space ones and there's also a guy in australia called ken stone and his cgs boards he did a, a lot of good building blocks as well and i think it's um partially his sequencer in this sequencer up here uh and then once you've got the basics you've got you know you can sort of uh produce melodies and then you start getting into the the weirder ones and uh there's just so much to choose from there's literally hundreds of manufacturers making well i call them manufacturers but there's also like hobbyists like there's um uh non-linear circuits um is this incredible guy who is just making them the most bizarre modules using uh emulating uh neuron activity and squid brains and all sorts of things so um he seems to read a lot of mathematical papers and then uh take the maths and apply it to audio uh pro just sort of producing voltages interesting voltages and so uh once you've got your basic few oscillators then you can start connecting them up to the squid brains to see what happens so yeah um it very quickly gets quite exciting yeah. one thing with the modular is when you first walk into the room it looks like this big sort of like incomprehensible intimidating sort of thing but um imagine if you got your mobile phone and you uh took an image of every single um screen sort of mode that it could have and then just lay them out on the floor as a4 printouts uh, that's kind of what the modular is instead of going through menus you've just got every option visible at once but once you realize the menu system, instead of going, oh, I'm going to send a text message to Bob or whatever, you just take the, you know, text message module and the Bob module and connect them. And so it's not that scary once you uh, realize that it's just routing where you want the audio to go. Um, the same with building the modules. I think a point I'd really like to get across is just to have a go and you'll, it's so, there'll be a, a point where you just go oh right i get it it's it's actually easy and it's uh choose something a good one would be like uh a ring modulator it's only six components there's two little transformers and four diodes and you just put them together and you can even do it with crocodile clips or, or whatever but if if you can if you can do a kid's jigsaw you could definitely build a ring modulator and then you connect a couple of things to it and then suddenly you've turned into a dialect and it's brilliant. And so that, that's a really good starting one. Um, but, you know, look into uh, getting a sort of um, blank circuit boards and have a go at soldering and, and very quickly you'll have, um, you know, this incredible functionality that otherwise you'd have to, I mean, buy some like expensive vintage synthesizer or you can just make it yourself or, you know, a couple of evenings plus not much money you just want people to have a go and uh there's no great skill to it it's, it's more like a practice and then uh 20 percent of what you make probably won't work and then it's getting better at troubleshooting and so yeah after putting all this sort of time and effort into making the modular um it would be great if people came to use it so do get in touch and um come and make a EP of weird electronic music. That's all for now. If you like what you saw, please be sure to like and share it and subscribe and click the bell icon so you know when we upload new content to our YouTube. Also find us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Thanks for watching.